It's good to see you all this afternoon. My name is Rob Fisher, and I'm a member of the faculty here at the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. I want to welcome you all to the first installment in our philanthropy series. Uh, this is an exciting discussion that we're starting uh, with our two guests this evening, and we'll be having another installment uh, at the end of February, uh, end of March, and end of April. So uh, please watch for those. Um, and in case you aren't aware, immediately following this uh, event, you are all invited to a reception at the end of the hall where we're having a very special announcement related to uh, the building renovation for the Mandel School. You're all welcome to come to the reception and there'll be a brief uh, program. Uh, and Dean Gilmore, who's here in the middle, will be uh, sharing some very exciting information with uh, those in attendance. So please come to that if you can. Um, you, you all came to a session, Conversations uh, in Philanthropy, and from the Latin uh, philanthropia, uh, which is originally from the Greek, meaning love for humanity, uh, it's a, a very powerful word, and in fact, philos, the root there, is one of three forms of love in Greek. And it's the type of love that can, is it's defined as consisting of an earthly love that is found through bonding together. And so I think as we reflect on the role of philanthropy and from its, its root meaning, it's important for us to connect to that very interpersonal aspect of philanthropy. Um, I was looking on YouTube for brief videos on ph philanthropy for a course and they were talking to people on the street and asking them, can you give me a definition of philanthropy? And honestly, most people couldn't. And the best one was, doesn't that have to do with stamps? <laughs> Just philip philipetics or something. Um, and here at the Mandel School, obviously, we have a deep passion for love of humanity through our degree programs in social work and nonprofit management, through our research, training, and service. Uh, so we have a long-standing commitment, commitment to this, so we're very excited to kind of raise the profile and discussion around philanthropy. And at, at this moment, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Gail Schlank, who is here with us, who, who was very influential in bringing this series uh, to be. Um, she's a member of the Mandel School Visiting Committee and a great friend of the school. And Gail, thank you for the leadership that you, you've shown and the support for uh, putting on this series. We really appreciate it. All right, well, enough for me. I'd like to introduce our two speakers for this evening. I'm so excited that they agreed to come. I'm delighted that they actually came. Um, all too often people agree and then maybe something will come up. Was that allowed? I've got to go. Let me try to sneak out before it's over. So I'm going to introduce them both to you and then invite uh, them to come up uh, individually, and then we'll have some time uh, for Q&A and discussion afterwards. I'd like to introduce John Guest uh, first. He is the manage, Managing Director of Philanthropy Ohio's uh, Northern Ohio office. And you may have known Philanthropy Ohio under its old name, the Ohio Grantmakers Forum, uh, which was renamed a couple years ago. John is a Rhode Island native, uh, came to Ohio for university, uh, and eventually settled here in Cleveland, his, his dad's hometown. He's been at Philanthropy Ohio for uh, since 2010, and previous to that, he was the assistant director for admissions here at Case Western Reserve. Um, so he's back back to his roots a little bit. Uh, he did his undergraduate work at Bowling Green State University and did his MBA here at Weatherhead. Um, I, the, my favorite part of his bio is that when he's away from work, he likes to stimulate the economy through sampling locally crafted beers, <laughs> living vicariously through Rick Steves, and he fights uh, breed-specific discrimination against pit bull terriers. So I didn't write this stuff, folks. <laughs> it's from the author. So John, thank you for being here. And I'd also like to introduce Marsha Egbert. Uh, Marsha is with the Gunn Foundation. She's the Senior Program Officer for Human Services. Uh, prior to being with the foundation, she was the vice president for the National Urban Policy Institute, uh, policy analysis and lobbying firm in Columbus. She's worked as government re relations director for the Cuyahoga County Commissioners, uh, and she also worked for the speaker of the Ohio, Ohio House of Representatives. Uh, she uh, 
holds a uh, two degrees from Ohio State University, a BA and a JD. And we're so pleased to have her. Marcia is a tremendous uh, friend of the Mandel School as well, as well uh, and that has been um, a great it is a great champion for many issues in our region and nationally. So with that, can we say uh, welcome to them? <laughs> Thank you. And I'll ask John to come up and offer his comments, and then we'll turn to Marsha. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, one, one note, with that MBA from Case West Reserve, I did get a, my concentration here uh, in the nonprofit management program. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> There's a couple of reasons why, but we'll, we'll save that for the Q&A. So I'm going to go over uh, a few things. I'm going to talk a little bit about Philanthropy Ohio, who we are. I'm going to talk about a little bit of the giving trends in Ohio and, and where uh, the dollars are flowing in and flowing out. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the tradition of philanthropy in Northeast Ohio. Now, I know I don't see Professor Hammock, so I'm not going to give a, tr a full rundown of that history and tradition, because if he sees this recording, I'll get an email correcting me. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about my, myself and my journey into this work and the work that we're doing and, and why I've enjoyed it so much. Uh, and I did not know when I arrived today that I'd have a member of my board of directors in the room. So uh, do not hold anything against me, Holly Fowler Martin. All right, yeah. So uh, if this works, look at this. That's me. We've already talked about that. Um, OK, if you do those kind of things, uh, here we are. So Philanthropy Ohio is one of over 20 uh, regionally based associations for the grant making community across the country. We happen to serve just the state of Ohio, with a few exceptions. Uh, we actually do have uh, a member organization in Erie, Pennsylvania, because they align more with this Rust Belt, and they might other parts of the state of Pennsylvania. We have some members uh, in West Virginia that are connected to Appalachia, Ohio, uh, and have similar uh, concerns. But uh, and, and we're being a statewide, there's some organizations that, uh, or some states that have multiple organizations. There's organizations that cover seven different states, such as Philanthropy North, Northwest. Uh, so this is who we are. I'm not obviously going to read everything to you. It's been up there for a few moments. Um, but we, we do want to highlight that change agent, and that's what we see philanthropy, and not just philanthropy, but those who carry out the mission of philanthropy in, in the nonprofit sector, in the government sector, uh, public schools that are funded in some ways by philanthropy. So that's what we're concerned about, helping our members uh, meet their charitable goals. Uh, we are a very unique nonprofit organization in such that we do not touch the ultimate beneficiary. You know, the food bank and uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs, they're working with the population that their mission is to serve, where we have a belief that philanthropy can better communities, and our organization can help make philanthropy better, help them do their work better. So we're, we're in a unique space in that way. Uh, how do we do this leading voice? We do a few things. Uh, through educating, when you're a new grant maker, we will put you through our series of the essential skills, kind of a grant making 101. Uh, we provide information to our members like any membership association would through newsletters and programming. Uh, the convening, that can be programming today uh, here in, out of our Cleveland-based office. We worked with the Gunn Foundation to co-host a policy briefing uh, from a simulcast from Washington, D.C. on the federal budget and then local in, our, in the room at the Gunn Foundation, local funders and policy experts from uh, Policy Matters Ohio and John Corlett from the Centers for Community Solutions talking about how the federal budget impacts Ohio and individuals and how the state budget that's been proposed by the governor would potentially impact uh, topics that philanthropy has interest in, Medicaid expansion, uh, disability coverage, and, and, and the like. And the other one uh, that Holly was at was our arts funders peer group that gets together quarterly just off the record, over lunch, no real agenda, just to check in with each other and make sure that different foundations and different grant makers are aware of what's going on in the community. So that's another example of the convening. Advocating, and, and Marsha can really speak to the role of advocacy and uh, the influence that uh, advocacy can have on bettering our communities. There's 
there's great work that can be done by a foundation giving a nonprofit several hundred thousand dollars, twenty-five thousand dollars, fifteen thousand dollars, but it pales into comparison when the state, the county, the federal government starts to activate real dollars that are going to trump anything that any foundation or collaboration of foundations could ever do. Uh, and then connecting, and this is really uh, an important part, the network that we try to build on behalf of our members so that they can learn from each other, be aware of each other's uh, interests, skills. Uh, this is not just in Northeast Ohio, but that's a tradition we can talk about a little bit in a moment uh, by these funder groups and the like, but also throughout the state. And then we are, as I mentioned, one of over 20 regional associations and our connections with other philanthropy Northwest that I mentioned in Donors Forum of Chicago, our connection uh, with those organizations also trickles down to help connect our members to, to larger national causes and uh, best practices. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on describing infographics because they're infographics and they're supposed to describe themselves. Uh, but I do wanna highlight quickly uh, some things going on in Ohio. In, in the most recent data that we have access to, and we partner with our friends at the Foundation Center and others to mine this data and do the review. Uh, but each year we publish what's called the Ohio Gives Report, and this uh, is taken out of that. It's a larger report, a larger uh, listing of graphics, but just some things I wanted to highlight here. Uh, you see where the breakdown of where the giving is in 7.8 billion, uh, and that uptick uh, because of so many folks making charitable contributions through their, their wills. Um, individuals, 78% of the total 7.8 billion. Foundations, only 16%. Uh, other funding, 4% there, and then the United Way. So it really is individuals. And, and as we changed our name from the Ohio Grantmakers Forum, Grantmakers speaks to those who receive grant applications, review them, and then write checks as grants to these nonprofits. But that's just a, a smaller portion. It's really people like myself and you who write the $50 check to the uh, Cleveland Friends of the Kennel who are trying to get these pit bulls uh, off the street and into good homes. Uh, so it's those individual contributions that is really making the larger difference. So as we changed our name, uh, we wanted to do that not just for a marketing uh, reason, but we wanted to recognize that philanthropy is changing and philanthropy isn't just quote unquote, organized philanthropy through foundations. Uh, so we opened up our, our doors and we have a broader tent. We, up until two years ago, did not have the United Ways as member organizations or a type of membership. We didn't have individuals. Uh, a lot of folks give through a family foundation and they set aside some funds and start the foundation and it's still a family activity, but just as many people, if not more, write checks out of their personal bank account, whether it's someone who's making 25, 50, 75, thousand dollars or someone who's a multimillionaire. Uh, in the other areas that we've expanded to, we've uh, opened up for government grant makers. So Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, for example, we, it was silly not to have them in the room for these discussions with other arts and culture funders because they're a major player in our county. Uh, there's statewide entities, there's giving circles, which we never connected with in the past. So uh, we've recognized what this data tells us and the fact that philanthropy is beyond foundations and we need to embrace all forms of philanthropy writ large. Uh, again, I was just talking about uh, salaries or income, and it, I think this is a very telling uh, infographic talking about where uh, folks that are not the 1%, can I use that term? Some people get offended by that. Uh, so it's folks who are making 50 to 200,000, and that's a broad range, I understand that, but that's where the vast majority of individual giving in Ohio is. Um, now, we gather this information just from folks that itemize uh, their deductions on their taxes, which is only one quarter. So folks that aren't itemizing and, and asking for that charitable deduction are probably giving just as much, if not more. So this data that we're presenting tonight is just a, a portion of what's really out there, uh, which I think, again, if, if we're only capturing uh, a quarter of these individuals, and it was such a large portion of the giving in the state already, uh, we're, we're only scratching the surface in what our research can show and tell us. So what do individuals support? And uh, we won't belabor this, we will get into uh, what the foundation community does in a moment, but uh, I think this is very interesting. Uh, 
religion, education, human services. Uh, a lot of this mirrors, except for religion, what foundations are doing. The other would be things such as a donation to the Cleveland Foundation. So if I start a donor advice fund, uh, that eventually may go to something that my family has a specific interest in. It may go to education, it may go to the environment, uh, but at the time that the donation is given, uh, it's just categorized, categorized as other. So that's also, uh, as we think about uh, investments where people pool their money together through uh, United Ways or, or giving to a community foundation, uh, there's a large percentage of that dollar in that line item as well. And, and I'll leave these slides up. I don't think Marsha has any slides, so I'll leave this active. And if during the question and answer we need to go back to any of this, I'm happy to do so. This infographic or a lot of this is also on our website uh, for you to, to go back and revisit. So now the foundation giving, moving away from just individuals, but uh, I think we definitely want to tell that story. The foundation world, which is a large part of our membership, uh, again, we've expanded it a little bit. Uh, here is just the breakdown. Uh, funding, the assets have grown in 2012, you see, by 12%. Uh, foundations, just like our own personal retirement accounts, really struggled when the markets went down. Uh, foundation dollars are not stored in the basement of the Cleveland Foundation or in the Gund uh, garage, but these are all invested dollars, usually in stock markets. Uh, so when those uh, funds went down when those stocks went down, foundations were hit. And the way that the majority of the foundation community operates is uh, they look backwards three years and they average out their assets and devise their funding structure based on a rolling average. So we're finally getting back to a point where uh, the coffers have been replenished and now after that trailing and that lagging experience, that money is now starting to get back out into the communities. And again, private uh, dollars, uh, community foundations, which there are uh, some in nearly every county in Ohio, some are multi-county, uh, some like Akron Community Foundation has a Medina County Fund. Uh, community foundations, the corporate foundations, this is also not an exact number because some corporations have a standalone foundation such as Key Bank, uh, but others just have corporate giving programs where they each year allocate certain amount of dollars, but it's not through a foundation structure. And then you gotta remember that corporations do a lot more of their giving than just dollars. They donate goods that they might have. If Giant Eagle may donate surplus food to a, a food bank, uh, they have a large workforce that can go out and volunteer hours or serve on boards. Uh, so corporate giving is a lot more dynamic than just the dollars. Uh, in Philanthropy Ohio, we have just about 215 member organizations throughout the state. About half, or maybe just over half, are actually in Northeast Ohio. So again, I'm gonna talk in a moment briefly about that tradition of giving in this community uh, and the reason why for a statewide organization that has only two offices, Columbus serving uh, 72 counties and my office here in Northern Ohio serving primarily uh, the 16 counties of the, the larger Fund for Our Economic Future footprint while I do uh, travel to, tomorrow to Toledo and, and work with those foundations. Uh, it's a tradition, we used to be two separate organizations, one just serving uh, this area, another organization serving the rest of the state uh, that merged several years ago, Case Western Reserve understands merging. Uh, so we merged, but one of the key negotiations points during that merger was you'll always have an office based in Northeast Ohio because of our desire to have this collaborative spirit. Um, but we don't capture anywhere near uh, a majority of the foundations in the state. But a lot of that is because a lot of these are small private family foundations that don't necessarily operate in the same way as a gun foundation. A lot of family foundations do. They have staff, they have family members that serve on the board actively, are very engaged in the community. Uh, but the majority of them around the state uh, are not currently members of our organization. If you know of any, we're happy to connect with them. And so what do foundations, this, again, I, I mentioned that it was pretty similar to what individuals care about. Again, uh, foundations are made up of staffs and boards that are individuals. So if a staff member is making a contribution uh, out of their own pockets, it's probably something that they're passionate about and that's one of the reasons they're working at the foundation they're at or volunteering on the board because this foundation is passionate about education and that's where my interest is. So it makes sense that these numbers line up a little bit 
uh, with that other document except for, again, the religion because there are some restrictions there on what foundations due to IRS code can and cannot fund. March can talk a lot more about that. Uh, throughout Ohio, uh, the top 10 Ohio foundations by giving. Again, uh, you'll notice a couple uh, corporate foundations here that doesn't capture every corporate dollar. Uh, some folks, just because of their structure, maybe other corporations should be or could be on this list, but uh, for lack of the traditional foundation structure, they wouldn't be captured. But uh, you see the Columbus Foundation, the Cleveland Foundation moving down. Community foundations, and, and I won't go into this because there's a lot of things I can't speak uh, very knowledgeable about, and one of them is uh, donor advice funds and how those dollars uh, are controlled within a community foundation but directed by a, a family who still advises those dollars. A lot of these, uh, these dollars from the Columbus Foundation, the Cleveland Foundation, Greater Cincinnati uh, are not necessarily board-driven decisions or staff recommendations to the board, but it's family-controlled. So there is some, uh, some nuance on how much uh, the board of the Cleveland Foundation actually has to give out. It's not the full 84.8 million. So that's just one of those nuances uh, to, to mention. Northeast Ohio specifically, uh, here's some information. Uh, I'm doing a very similar presentation in Northwest Ohio tomorrow in Toledo. Uh, and of the percentage of dollars given away in Ohio, Northwest Ohio is about 3%. Uh, Cleveland, 1.26 billion of the 7.8 billion that we highlighted earlier. Uh, we are benefiting uh, much more so than other parts of the state. We do have larger population, potentially. We have different kind of uh, uh, landscape, potentially. Uh, but we are benefiting from a rich tradition, not just here in Cleveland, uh, where the majority of the money obviously is in our MSA, but also Akron, Canton, Youngstown. So I will. Uh, Stop the formal presentation there, and I just have a couple more comments before we bring Marsha up. And uh, that tradition, again, I'm not going to go into full history, but I think it's important for us to, to reflect, and you're in this room, you're in this building, you're in this program in some way, so you probably know uh, a lot about the rich tradition, again, especially if you took uh, Professor Hammock's class. That was a long class. That was a long time ago. Um, but so going back to the 1830s when uh, we had a lot of sailors coming through town, and the Western Seaman Friends Society was, was established uh, not only to provide uh, information and in, in healthy living, but I love the fact that it was uh, to provide moral education to those crazy sailors when they're on uh, shore leave. Uh, the 1880s, 1880 actually, when Leonard Case Jr. Made a, had a large inheritance uh, where he set aside a portion of that inheritance to establish uh, what was then the Case Institute of Technology. I used to, when I was an admission officer next door, I would give this presentation all the time and I knew everything about this. 1881, amassed a stone, made a donation to purchase the land and move, pay for the relocation of West Reserve College from Hudson here to University Circle. Um, Cleveland first last year, 19, uh, 2014, as you probably remember from the events in our community, from media, uh, we celebrated the centennial of Frederick Goff's vision, which was the first ever community foundation, the Cleveland Foundation. Uh, so that was one of the first 1919, uh, what is now, which was one of the two precursors for what's now called the United Way, it was the community chest. Uh, 1973, the first healthcare conversion uh, in the United States, which when, an, when a for-profit hospital, or when a hospital sold to a for-profit entity, those monies had to be put into a charitable organization. So you think St. Luke's, Mount Sinai, which again was right from this neighborhood. I try to do a theme of the neighborhood, you see. Um, and then in 1952, the Gunn Foundation. But we'll let Marsha talk about, about that. Uh, so finally, as I, as I said, I wanted to mention myself briefly. Uh, when I was working here at Case Western Reserve and going through the MBA program and the nonprofit concentration, I really wanted to get out and be more civically engaged. And I loved the work I was doing recruiting students from across, my, my territory was across the United States, I didn't do international recruitment, here to Cleveland to take advantage of Case Western Reserve. Uh, but I also live in the city of Cleveland. Uh, my wife's a Cleveland public school teacher. Uh, so I know the realities of what it is to, to live in Cleveland. I know their struggles. I know struggles continue to evolve. And I want to do something more civically in, uh, minded. 
And I looked at nonprofits, I looked at foundations, I looked at public policy, working for the city of Cleveland maybe or the county. Uh, and one Sunday evening, uh, this is after I'd finished my MBA and I was ready to move on after five and a half years at Case. And I only remember it was a Sunday evening because I visited the Case job board uh, through the Weatherhead School of Management. <laughs> and there was this job for the position I'm in now for Ohio Grantmakers Forum, which I knew, didn't know what that was. We had a horrible website at the time, so that didn't help me get any sense. But the job was, uh, the application was due the next day, Monday. Uh, so I put in an application. I met with the staff, the board. Uh, and what I found was this was a great first step foray for me into this world because I would have one foot in the nonprofit world. I'm working at a nonprofit. But we're in a unique position that we are also have one foot into the funding community. And we sit, the meeting I was with Marsha at earlier today, the meeting I was with Holly at earlier today, we're the only nonprofit sitting there listening to these conversations about uh, things that might eventually uh, help understand, inform what they're going to fund. Uh, and that's potentially priceless information I could go and sell on the, the black nonprofit market that I hear that Gund is really interested in this area. And if you mission creep over there, there's probably dollars for you. Uh, but we also have a foot in the, the policy world. You know, uh, advocacy is such a big part whether it's the city council of Cleveland, the, the county administrator. We do a lot of work uh, in Columbus around uh, education reform on behalf of our members, uh, healthcare implementation. We have a coalition of our members that we work with. Uh, so it was really a, a unique space for me to be in uh, to learn more about this entire sector from many different viewpoints. So that's uh, my background. And now I'll go and sit down. Thanks. <laughs> John, and I, I don't know if you caught this vibe or not, but David Hammock, Professor David Hammock of the History Department, is teaching a class just to I have a flashback. He was horrified when he realized he couldn't be here <laughs> yeah. uh, at this session, but you can drop in afterwards. <laughs> so what John just gave us was this kind of macro view of, of this greater funding community. And I think, you know, the first time I heard heard this discussion, it's kind of mind-blowing to think about the scope and scale. Uh, I think we all have a kind of a, a template view of what a foundation might look like. So John brings that, that sense that there's this really diverse community out there. Now we could have any number of funders come up here, and I think John would say something like, when you know one funder, you know one funder. That's, and that's the reality. You, you get to know each funder, and they're all different. Um, so we invited one of our most favorite <laughs> the George oh, Gunn well Foundation. Said, well. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a foundation that is well regarded in our community, in our region, nationally and internationally. So they're not, they're not the you know, mom and pop uh, operation down on the corner. They, they are known around the world for their work because of their vision. And I'm so delighted that Marsha to be here. And so we're, we're going to now drill down in, into the experience of one great foundation, so you can hear a little bit more depth uh, from that one perspective. All right, thank you. Hello. Thank you so much, Rob, um, for this absolutely wonderful invitation um, to join you here today and to talk about one of my truly most favorite subjects, and that's the role of philanthropy in promoting social change. But first, let me just take a second to express my love for the Mandel School. <laughs> um, it is a community treasure. And from your incredibly bright and dedicated students to the invaluable, and I do mean invaluable, faculty that are such remarkable resources and true scholar activists. Um, on so many fronts, to your wonderful Dean, <laughs> who brings such humanity to every endeavor you touch, and, um, and to the alumni, who I think are making such remarkable contributions, not just across this community, in every aspect of social service delivery, but really across the country and across the world. It's an amazing legacy. We are so lucky to have the Mandel School in this community. Um, and we have been so fortunate and proud to support it over the years. 
So I won't dwell on the history of the George Gunn Foundation, but I would love to give you just the briefest background that will hopefully provide you some context for the rest of my remarks today. So first of all, we are not the gun teddy bears, although it would be fun if we, fun if we were. I wish we were. I could have brought you all great trinkets. Um, but our founder, George Gunn III, was a great Cleveland leader who made his first fortune patenting decaffeinated coffee, believe it or not. It's what became Sanka brand and eventually was bought by the Kellogg Corporation um, and lives on today. Most um, I think known to this community though, he was the president of the Cleveland Trust Company, which now has morphed over the years into Key Bank but we are thrilled with the restoration of the Cleveland Trust Company headquarters at the corner of East 9th and Euclid. And if you've never had the chance to be inside that building and it's about to reopen in all of its glorious restoration, go see the Rotunda, which is truly one of the most spectacular um, works of art in this community. And we'll be buying a lot of groceries at Heinen's when it opens over the in the next couple of days. Um, but really do, if you have the chance, make time to see it because it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of art and architecture that's so thrilling to be restored. So Mr. Gunn started the foundation, as John said, in 1952, and he's left a really deep imprint across this community, but particularly here in university circles. So if you go around the corner to the, um, the Gunn Law School or the new wing at the Cleveland Institute of Art or um, the Cleveland Museum of Art, his imprint is still felt really deeply to this day. So having you know that helps me segue, I think, to the most important thing I can tell you about the foundation, and that's that it truly reflects a very deep commitment to place, to this place, to the greater Cleveland community that was the home of our founder and remains our home today, even as we are deep into the third generation of Gund family trustees. And that doesn't always happen with a family foundation. Sometimes when you get deeper into next generations, it begins to spread out and the geography disperses and so forth. But we are so lucky that this family, even though they don't reside here on a daily basis, is so deeply committed to the greater Cleveland community and to greater Cleveland's future. So, but our, our philanthropic stewardship doesn't just derive from our history, it also uh, stems from a belief that Cleveland has and can continue to develop original responses to urban issues and no place manifests that more profoundly than the Mandel School. And also from our hope that creative collaboration, another hallmark of this institution, can propel innovation in many, many fields. So. We fervently believe that thriving cities are one of the nation's best hopes for addressing essential human challenges, but that in order to tackle these challenges, we have to embrace efforts to promote social change. We hope that a similar realization or belief is spreading across those in the funding community, where year after year, of course, dollar after dollar is spent trying to ameliorate conditions that too often, we all might think, don't seem to change fast enough. But what if investments were made to change the policies that may create those tough conditions in the first place? What if philanthropy looked for the root causes of problems and funded smart, sophisticated efforts to address these issues? In other words, as opposed to funding in the deep end of the pool of social problems, what if philanthropy focused upstream? Upstream, I, we would argue, is where public policy is formulated, debated, and influenced. Government has, of course, an enormous role in determining the broader landscape in which nonprofits operate. A homeless shelter director ought to care about the availability of state housing funds. Leaders of an after-school program ought to care about the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. 
all nonprofit leaders should care about whether our national and state budget and fiscal policy creates a climate for increasing or shrinking available public resources. So let me tell you quickly about the five main reasons that we fund efforts to promote social change. First, in our view, funding social change efforts and direct services are really flip sides of the same coin. We can't and we shouldn't ignore immediate pressing needs in our own backyard. The homeless need a roof over the, their heads. Children need clothes. The hungry need meals. So we support shelters and clothing programs and food banks. But at the same time, foundations can't hope to make a lasting impact on issues like homelessness or hunger without affecting the policy environment direct service providers operate in and working to draw as much public investment to an issue as possible. So direct service and policy grant making go hand in hand. They can be used together to effectively do what we all want to do and that's to make a difference. One of my uh, heroes is the re renowned peace activist and faith leader, the Reverend William Sloan Coffin. And I've always thought that he said it best, that charity is a matter of personal attribute, but justice is a matter of, per of public policy, and never can the first be a substitute for the second. So direct service, that's charity. Engaging in social change efforts, that's justice. When you think about it, it's natural that the charitable impulse bends towards the needs of the moment. We all want to help that person, that child, that family that's directly in front of us and needs help now. But we would argue that philanthropy also must constantly look to the horizon in order to achieve the greatest good. So the most out, think about the most challenging issues that we face, and take your pick, poverty, racial tensions, environmental degradation. These are systematic and entrenched challenges. To tackle them, we need more than a shot in the arm. And I don't mean in any way, shape, or form to say that charity is anything other than invaluable. But to really tackle these entrenched problems, we do need more than a shot in an arm. We need transformation, and that can take a little while. So second, and John mentioned this, while private philanthropy annually contributes an extraordinary amount, you've seen the figures just in our own backyard, and it's to a whole range of causes, of course, impacting the, the common good, our combined resources really do pale in comparison to the resources of the public sector. Appropriate, targeted investments in advocating for policy change can leverage public dollars far beyond any dollars for direct services that a foundation might ever be able to provide. Consider this example. For, for years, the Gunn Foundation has supported Cleveland area low-income housing programs with grants the total probably about a, a close to a million dollars a year. So nothing at all to sneeze at. I mean, it's a lot of money and a lot of investment. But over the last decade, we've simultaneously invested in a campaign directed by the Coalition on Homelessness and Housing in Ohio to create and fund a state housing trust fund. Now the Ohio Housing Trust Fund provides $50 million annually to support low-income housing across the state, of which nearly $10 million comes directly back to the benefit of Greater Cleveland just last year. Similarly, we're absolutely proud to support local hunger relief organizations in their work to provide hot meals and emergency food supplies to thousands of poor Clevelanders every day. But about a half a dozen years ago, we also began to provide roughly $75,000 a year to the Ohio Association of Food Banks. And it has now leveraged those funds into two line items in the state budget totaling $14.5 million annually for expanded emergency food relief that helps over one million Ohioans annually. We could never, ever do that on our own. The third and perhaps one of the most important rationales for funding social change work is to promote the nonprofit sector's role 
as the voice for the powerless, a surrogate for those who typically are excluded from public policy debates. So when foundations underwrite such work, we help, we don't do it, but we help bring the views represented by tens of thousands of Ohioans with little or no direct access to the halls of power into the marketplace of ideas. Fourth, we also believe that nonprofits actually have an obligation to, believe, to engage in social change efforts. So whether we like it or not, statutory and regulatory policies set the framework by which nonprofits conduct their business. So for nonprofits to sit on the sidelines while the environment in which they operate is formulated by others, we believe does a disservice to their clients and constituents. Leaving the playing field to others just shouldn't be an option. Finally, funding advocacy should be done because it can be done, contrary to the belief of many in philanthropy and the nonprofit sector, efforts at promoting social change, and yes, even direct lobbying, are not only perfectly legal, but they're actually supported by provisions in the federal tax code. Of course there are parameters, but they're easy to understand, and they're there to be employed for the benefit of nonprofit organizations and ultimately, of course, for their constituents. So philanthropy has a unique role to play in engaging the public policy arena that should be embraced. While we certainly strive to operate at the highest levels of accountability that we, we can, the, the world of philanthropy is actually free of a lot of the bureaucratic restraints that slow a government's ability to respond to social concerns. So how great is that? That this allows us to engage in our communities in ways that can powerfully shape the debate, the creation, and impact of public policy. And what do I mean by that? So what are some of the roles that philanthropy can do? Well, we can be a catalyst to help drive an issue onto the public agenda. We can experiment. We have the luxury of doing that, unlike the levels of accountability with public funding. We can use the power of philanthropy to convene diverse parties to a common table. We can be sort of a good housekeeping seal of approval, a legitimizer, for lack of a better term, on certain issues. And we can often mediate where well-intentioned people are reaching different conclusions around an issue that must be addressed. So it feels like it's a great luxury to be in a field that can both support and withstand risk-taking. Pursuing social change carries with it inherent risks. It can be messy. It can take a long time. But if we avoid what's difficult to measure, we will only do the simplest things and not what actually needs to be done. So nowhere in philanthropy is the opportunity for great reward more evident than in working to prod or coax or cajole or force, on occasion, uh, systemic change. As our president, Jeff Gunn, said in one of his annual letters, we've, we've gradually focused more of our funding on the sometimes elusive front of public policy activities because there lies the opportunity to support lasting solutions to the seemingly intractable problems that so clearly separate the haves from the have-nots in our community. And at the end of the day, we can't think of a more noble bet to place. So thank you so much for letting me join you today, and I really look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you, John, as well. Um, wonderful comments. And as you're preparing your thoughts, uh, we're very uh, interested in, in hearing comments and questions from the audience. More, more so comments. <laughs> More so comments <laughs> that require no response, apparently. Um, and a, a completely unsolicited uh, benefit from both, both your comments is that you use the social change terminology. And coincidentally, I was going to present to our speakers the official Mandel School <laughs> magnet Go, changes yay. at the end of the talk. So now you get to hey, proclaim this from your bumper. Name of the center. <laughs> uh, which is it, so uh, so beautifully uh, resonant with, with the theme here. 
Um, I really, I really enjoyed uh, both levels of, of your comments here, and Marsha, I think you finished there on uh, really challenging us to, uh, to in a way, expect more from our funders and from the nonprofit sector. And you actually answered one of a question I was going to ask you both uh, about the influence of foundations, because it's often remarked that, well, if they only give 15% of the money, why do they have so much influence? And I think you answered it very eloquently with the notion it's, it's not about the pocketbook. The pocketbook is part of the story, but it's about these other functions that foundations can play so beautifully around convening, catalyzing, being the first money in to an initiative to pilot and show benefit before the cavalry, if you will, the governmental funding can be brought to bear on an issue they can demonstrate um, you know, potential uh, returns that we would never know about and without them being involved. So thank you for answering my first question. Um, so I'm not gonna ask my next question because I want to go right to you all. And I'm told that this big mic over here will pick up your every utterance. So you, if you wouldn't mind um, just maybe saying your name and uh, Asking if you want to direct your question, or you can direct it to the panel. And we'll decide who will best answer it. So, could I invite someone to Catrice in the back? Could you stand, Catrice, so we can see? You? Now she's wishing she hadn't raised her hand. Um, do I have to stand? Well, I want to be able to see your, your lovely face. Um. So I just had a quick question in terms of talking about social change. My question is more towards this idea of collective impact. Um, we recently read an article in class, and it's just quickly, it's just about different actors coming together for a common agenda to solve a specific social problem. And um, in this article, it talked about different philanthropic organizations pulling their resources together um, to influence higher, to influence secondary education or education in general in the greater Cincinnati area and northern Kentucky. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, about not only having um, philanthropic organizations meeting together to put their money into a specific cause, um, and also partnering with other actors, whether it be um, public agencies, whether it be schools, whether it be um, other actors who can also um, go towards impacting the social changes you talked about earlier. Um, so maybe if you could speak. Marsha, would you like to start out on that one? Uh, sure. It's a big question, and there's not um, it doesn't invite one simple answer, but rather more like, a, I think, a conversation about how many different ways there are to pursue and ultimately achieve that kind of collective impact that you're referencing. And we are incredibly lucky, I think, in our community to have a really rich history of collaboration. And it is massively hard to use that word without sounding cliched and I wish I could talk about it <laughs> by in using different language because it's anything but cliched in practice and it is anything but typical to experience the type of really rich collaboration that we see in this community and, and you raise an important point that it's not only among philanthropy partners but really among philanthropy and many other sectors and we've are just replete with examples where the collective engagement has allowed for greater outcome or greater impact than any one sector could have provided. So let me just give you a quick example. Take the Cleveland plan for transforming schools. So um, a, a transformative, there, there's another word that's hard to not sound cliche, but in this instance, it is truly a transformative plan for public education. Um, and while it lives and breathes within the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, it truly um, reflects a community-wide embracing and endeavor to improve not just the Cleveland Metropolitan S School District itself, but the delivery of education in our community starting at the preschool level and connecting into higher education. And that is because it has um, public sector support at the state, 
and local level and within the local level at the county and city level and the district. It's got philanthropy ranging from the Gates Foundation to the Cleveland Foundation and GUND and many of our other philanthropic organizations based here in Cleveland. It's created a new entity to oversee and provide deep public accountability in the creation of the Transformation Alliance, a novel, unique way of bringing public oversight to the arena of school reform. So I appreciate you raising this because collective impact deserves to be more than a cliche and it really lives here in this community and most importantly demonstrates that it can be done across sector and sort of across geographies and is the way to do business, we would argue, if you want to achieve the greatest impact. John, do you want to add anything? Well, no, I think those are great examples. I think the Cleveland Plan, you know, the other couple more elements, you can continue to peel this back, but the partnering with quality charter schools, mm -hmm. the fact that this in required enabling legislation to make these changes, so it, it, it's state government, it's the mayor, it's the governor. Uh, you know, and it, the Cincinnati model, uh, Strive, is amazing, and it brings together all sorts of different sectors, and they have, you know, the collective impact has some certain definitions with the backbone and all this, which other collaborations may not fully fit in the collective impact definition, but uh, looking over in the Slavic Village neighborhood, uh, the work that Third Federal has done with their Broadway uh, P16 bringing together, that's just one foundation committed to one neighborhood, but being able to be the neutral or natural convener and the organizer to get all these uh, in school and out of school organizations, community assets all working together. So the list could go on and on, different examples that don't necessarily fit collective impact, but I think it, it is the game changer. Uh, and it, it it really does require all these different sectors and different interests to come together. So. Wonderful. Thank you. Do you have a question? Uh, my name is Kirsten Hagestad, and I'm an alumni in NYC. You just pushed a button. Uh -oh. um, Very bad. Either's good. Either's <laughs> fine. <laughs> I'm really excited about, hopefully, about what happened in the school system in Cleveland, and mm -hmm. how we'll hopefully have an impact, or hopefully the whole community will get involved in it. My point is that we can do as much as we want to about the schools. And we can involve all the suburbs into the Cleveland schools and get, get it across. But as long as people don't have health insurance, work at the, a place where they get their work scheduled a week in advance, how can they benefit from good preschool? They can't do that. So the school issue cannot stand alone. It really has to spread out to all the other. And, and when you talk about going from like the, the uh, from um, charities of philanthropy in terms of levels mm -hmm. and getting the food, the food bank and the homeless services into the, on the state level, that's great, but it doesn't solve the problem. My problem is how can we do it? And I think you have the answer. <laughs> How much time have I got? Well, you know, we wouldn't disagree with you um, at the foundation, and it's why there's not one program area, you know, in the sense that um, goodness knows we could take the 20 to 25 million dollars that we're fortunate enough to be able to provide in the community every year and put it just into school reform and um, hope to put it to the best use. But the fact of the matter is, and you'll see this as an increasing trend in philanthropy is that there is a much greater degree of sort of interdisciplinary, intertwined levels of engagement. And it's certainly true at the Gund Foundation and I think it's true in much of philanthropy that we absolutely see, whether it's you want to use the analogy of peeling the layers of an onion or we're braiding together, um, absolutely intertwined in, um, effects and challenges, we can't just address one area and hope to achieve the actual kind of, again, use, using a cliched term, a systemic change that we'd want to, to see. So we agree wholeheartedly and 
um, hopefully our investments demonstrate that you've got to address the needs of the individual as a whole as opposed to one element. So you're right, we can't just invest in education without also investing in the need for a healthy child to be able to walk through that school door and healthy both physically and mentally. Um, we can't just help make the child whole if they live in a fractured family <laughs> and without recognizing that there's family supports needed. And we can't put a healthy child and a whole family out into a community where there's environmental injustices or um, you know, truly challenging environmental circumstances that don't help that family live a healthy life. So we would agree that you've got to intertwine these. It's never enough um, to go around, but we think that the very best bets are to do that at the system change level while also trying to ameliorate the daily need and that they are absolutely hand in glove together. Other questions or comments? Hi, my name is Carrie Miller. I'm also an alum um, and I'm currently at the Foundation Center. And I guess my question for both of you to a certain extent is, are you seeing other foundations, particularly other than the large influential foundations in Northeast Ohio and across the state engaging in that same kind of activity? Because I think that as much as nonprofits don't know that they can engage, um, foundations and others don't realize that as well. And then that leads to the second question of, how are you encouraging and educating nonprofit organizations to their role in this type of work and letting them know that it is OK to, to participate? When you say this activity? The, uh, the, the advocacy, advocacy. And, and working at that level of addressing issues. Yeah, it's a great question, and it's sort of a never-ending thing. But to the first part of your question, absolutely, positively, yes. There are more foundations all of the time, um, whether it's dipping a toe or throwing all in um, to engagement in the public policy arena, broadly defined. I mean, there's very many ways to come into that work. It, 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 it Really, there's a very broad spectrum of possible strategies to engage in. Um, but we are seeing more all the time, and particularly in Northeast Ohio, John mentioned the really rich um, tradition that we have of health conversion foundations, um, which we really ha are unbelievably fortunate to have sort of a disproportionate number in our own backyard. So Mount Sinai, uh, St. Luke's, the Deaconess Foundation, others, um, all of whom have been involved in this kind of um, social change work in their own way and in increasing partnership, um, which has truly been encouraging. But you're absolutely right that there's a lot of myths out there about the legalities or appropriateness of this. And I appreciate you raising the question, so how do you sort of spread the word? And it's not that it's ever going to be for everybody. That's fine. But the fact is we don't want it not to be pursued because of misunderstandings or a lack of education and understanding about what the rules really are. So the single best resource that I would say we've invested in is an organization called the Alliance for Justice. And some of you might have heard of it. Many perhaps have not. But I would encourage you to go and look them up. Their website is one of the most easily navigated, user-friendly sources of information about the power and the way in which both nonprofits and philanthropy can engage in the public policy process. Their Boulder Advocacy Initiative has every conceivable tool to put at your fingertips from plain English analysis of the law to actual tools that you can use to promote engagement, be you a nonprofit or philanthropy. And we've worked for years with them to develop free web-based tools to understand the legal do's and don'ts, and also 
to evaluate the work because that was truly tricky business. Like one of the reasons some foundations were reluctant to engage in this kind of grant making was how on earth do you measure it? You know, you fund a food bank and you can really easily tell how many hot meals are going to in the community, how many pounds of food are you putting out that touch a person's life on a daily basis. But how do you measure the impact of an advocacy grant? It looks a lot different than a direct service grant. So there's now free web-based tools that nonprofits can use as almost a checklist or, or foundations can use to help guide an analysis that's fair and appropriate for that kind of grant making. And then we're going to be bringing the Alliance for Justice team to Cleveland in the spring to host a free training for nonprofits and foundations um, that we'd be thrilled to work with the Mandel School in bringing. We'll be partnering with the Center for Community Solutions to do that. And it'll be a free couple of hour hands-on um, opportunity to really go through the nuts and bolts of this. So I, Carrie, I would, I would say as Marcia just said, more and more, but I'd also say not enough. Yeah. Um, so I think these trainings in, in Philanthropy Ohio through our annual conference and through webinars and in-person programs have talked, at least with our constituency, and then we hope yeah. the foundations go out and work with the nonprofits that they work with about uh, the rights to do advocacy and the impact. Uh, but there's also advocacy that's done that funders or nonprofits don't realize is advocacy. You know, anytime a lot of these healthcare conversion funds are are place based in a way where they really care about the neighborhoods where the hospital used to be. So that's really uh, a, a unique factor that those conversion funds have, and they have great relationships with the council people in those neighborhoods. So even if they're just talking about the grants they're making to impact the community, just putting that idea in the councilman's uh, mind or bringing the councilman into uh, some kind of a meeting that's or introducing good. them, that's advocacy even though they may not realize that it's advocacy because it's not a grant that falls under advocacy. Uh, and more and more across the state, uh, I, I mentioned briefly, I believe, uh, we have two statewide advocacy initiatives at Philanthropy Ohio and our education initiative, which is impacting statewide policy, started in 2006 and for uh, nearly nine years now, uh, 30, 40 funders from throughout the state, uh, beyond just being members of Philanthropy Ohio and there's a membership contribution to help us do our work, there's separate dollars that they invest together to work in Columbus and in our communities to address uh, changes that need to happen at, at the state level in, in education policy. After the Healthcare Implement Act was implemented in 2011, we brought uh, funders together. Now we know some people individually or even organizations might be for or against, but when it was reality, well, how are we going to promote this initiative and, and have people have access to the health care? Uh, so let's devise a strategy. Medicaid got expanded. The, the health care initiative lobbied or came out in favor of that. Uh, so those are some statewide coalitions that we, through Philanthropy Ohio, have. There's, we have a sister organization, OANO, that serves the nonprofit community as a membership organization. They are out there trying to educate their members on advocacy, the formal role, not that just uh, informal role that people don't realize they're really advocating. So I think more and more, not enough. I'm gonna take, oh, Claudia, go ahead. Do we have time? Oh, we have time. I was gonna ask a question myself, okay. but I, I will defer to Dr. Cole. Okay, <laughs> I am Claudia Cole. Uh, here at the Mandel School, um, appreciate um, all this uh, talk of advocacy because we um, we teach it here at the Mandel School to our students, and uh, it's a very you know big part of uh, of what we believe in. Um, but um, I, I'd like to move a little bit to a, sort of a different advocacy topic, um, I think, because um, we know that uh, I'll just say the economy is sort of rigged right now against the average person. Um, and that is um, an area where I think advocacy has been particularly challenging to come up with from the philanthropic sector and from the nonprofit sector. Um, maybe it's in part because you know, figuring out what to do about it and what to advocate for is really diff difficult. But I wondered what you saw on the horizon um, in, in that regard. Um, 
around the, the basic uh, chances people have to work and earn a living and have a schedule of work that they can live with and that they can have families and so forth. Um, is, is anything happening on the rest? Yeah, it's such an incredibly powerful question. Um, and John alluded to this session that we were lucky to host this morning in our offices. We are unbelievably fortunate to have in this state two organizations, Policy Matters Ohio and the Center for Community Solutions that go to the heart of what you just asked to try and translate the remarkably complex, and I'm happy to use your word, rigged system um, of the world of tax and fiscal and budget policy. Man, it is hard to make that sexy, but there is nothing that impacts what we have as resources available to us as average citizens more than impacting what to me is the biggest moral document of any government and that's their budget. So whether it's the city or the county or the state or the federal level, it's the, it's the budget that sets, sets the priorities, states the priorities of government. And if you're not working to understand and then we would say influence the framework of any government budget, you're missing the single greatest opportunity to impact the largest number of people, and certainly those in the 99%. Um, and so we have invested deeply and long, over long time, to build up the capacity of those kind of analytic organizations. It's so different than the tangible outcome of a housing program, you know, where you can really see today and tomorrow the roof over the head of the family that needs it. We would never argue that that's not critical, but the resources that those organizations have, the resources that those families that occupy those homes have, are all impacted by the framing of public budgets. And it is well worth the energy and time to understand and engage and to have organizations in our backyard that work to translate that is essential. So I, I urge you to know about the work of those two organizations and to follow their public um, budget uh, translation as it moves through the processes and then in Ohio, that's been coupled with a growing and genuinely influential statewide advocacy network called Advocates for Ohio's Future. And they link the work of the analytics to the impact of daily Ohio, of Ohioans on a daily basis and create that voice and face um, of the common person in the halls of government. So if you go on the website of Advocates for Ohio's Future, you will see the big tent of nonprofit organizations statewide that have joined together under a set of principles to say, we need greater fairness and equity brought to our public investment as manifest through the state budget process, which is just underway now. So. The, your center, Claudia, the Center on Urban Poverty and Community Development has been an essential resource to that work, um, to say the least. But know that there are ways to connect in by following the work of those organizations and becoming a part of Advocates for Ohio's future um, engagement. It's open to all. I would just say uh, that's a great point, that's the work that the centers does. Uh, the data that you are able to produce and provide to the funding community, to the county about you know, access to early childhood education and, and all these things that you're tracking here at Case Western Reserve, uh, that informs philanthropy and informs the decisions they're making. So even, again, when you go with that broad definition of advocacy, the, that data set allows Absolutely. for folks to, to make informed decisions and justify or to challenge um, the system, a much different uh, perspective than you know, state budget policy and the like, but um, academic institutions, whether it's Case or CSU or Ohio State, really help throughout the state inform philanthropy because they capture, analyze data, and then tell stories with that data. 
Can I pick up on that, the data theme? Sure. <laughs> um, over the last couple decades, many of our nonprofit friends and grantees uh, from the funding community have wrung their hands about the demands placed on them to show their benefit, to document outcomes, to move the needle, whatever the terminology is. I don't want to ask you about that. I want to ask you about the what goes on for the funders themselves. How do funders evaluate themselves? I know there's been a lot of developments and a lot of pressure, particularly from Washington, about making sure that foundations are a good investment socially more than just check writing. And I think we've heard a lot from Marsha about that, that added value. But Marsha and John, I wanted you to talk a little bit about what you know from the broader community. And then Marsha, I know you all have a particular emphasis on this. But how do, you, how do we evaluate grant makers more than the sum total of what they funded? Yeah, what a great question. And we do it in two excruciating ways. Um, the first being an um, anonymous survey that we um, give to all of our grant partners every few years that provide the safe space to share what we find to be incredibly constructive feedback about how we do our work. And that has been a relatively recent development, I would say, in the field of philanthropy, really in the last decade or so, a, a, an understanding that it's only fair um, that we try, and I won't ever say that we succeed at truly holding ourselves to the same standards that we you know, clearly demand of others, but this tool of anonymous input has been incredibly powerful for us. It has changed and improved, we hope, and influenced almost every element of our grant making. And um, it is something that we are deeply committed to. And we've seen blossom in the field of philanthropy. Another one of those things I would say is really not as, as broadly embraced as it might be or could be or should be, but it's growing and it's a and it's a good, honest, sincere attempt. We always tell ourselves, you know, when you're fortunate enough to be on this particular side of the table, look, we know all too well our jokes always get laughed at and um, we have You look lovely tonight. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so to be able to have anything that we can do to diffuse that inherent um, disproportionate relationship is valuable, really valuable for us. And then we also have to do um, self-reviews. How many of you have ever had to go through the excruciating process of doing a self-review? Yow! Um, that is read by every one of our board members and um, our director. And it's a really valuable exercise, not only to try and be honest with ourselves, but to set a course for um, the next year's activity. So those have both been really useful tools um, that we would John, you mentioned best practices a little bit ago about the sharing of best practices. Is that kind of the state of the art? Well, I, I think I think best practices are great, and I think that's one of the reasons philanthropic organizations join us as a member because they want to be in touch with others that are doing this work, but hopefully doing this work yeah. well, and they want to learn from each other. It's a culture of learning in our organization, um, and I think it's great that philanthropy is under the spotlight in uh, being investigated by Washington to keep us honest because this is public money. Even though it's not coming in through taxes into a city, county, or federal system, as soon as a foundation is established, it's, it's the public's money. And even if it's your own family foundation and three members of your family sit on the board and make all the funding decisions, the way that the money got into that foundation was this is now a community asset. So I think being held accountable and being questioned uh, is great. Um, and I think other, certain foundations have different processes uh, or rely on outside organizations 
that does the grantee perception report on their behalf to make sure it's valid. Um, so I, yeah, I think best practice is whatever that means. Uh, you've seen one foundation, you've seen one foundation. Uh, you've seen a best practice. Well, it's a best practice for that organization or that funding area. Um, so I, I, I think uh, it, it all depends. But I think when someone becomes, uh, when a foundation decides to hire a staff, that's because they want the work to be done well and they want to hire professionals. Family foundations that don't have staff who join Philanthropy Ohio, they do that because they realize this is, this is new. This is not the primary role that I have in my life because I'm, I have my own job, I have my own family, I do this. A few times a year the family gets together at Thanksgiving to make these funding decisions, but I want to be a part of a network where I can be the unstaffed family foundation trustee and lean upon Marsha's expertise because she does this professionally day in and day out. So uh, I think there's a lot of good going on there uh, and it's, it's great. You know, I know some foundations, they don't have a formal process, but they have a mentality of, we're having our family foundation retreat, where should we have it? Well, if it showed up on the front page of the Plain Dealer on uh, a Sunday morning that this foundation held a retreat in Hawaii, and we have no family in Hawaii, and we don't fund in Hawaii, is that right? What's the perception there? So there may just be that, that basic test of what happens if this got out that may inform decision making, which is good in and of itself. Right, I think we have time for one or two more questions. This is your moment. Ms. Gale. Since we're sitting on a school campus, university campus, and particularly this school here, what would you suggest? We have professors like Professor Fisher who can teach the students the information. Uh, but there's also the inspiring the students to really get involved on this whole concept of philanthropy. It's perhaps a missing component. Uh, I'm not reflecting on any one of the schools. It would be, I think, equal way of medical school, law school, business school, social work school. How can younger people or newer to the environment, even if they are coming back to school, uh, to become inspired in pursuing what you all have proposed here today, which I think has come through with strength. It's an interesting question. There's, uh, there's a couple of things that come to mind. First of all, the areas of the university that I've been fortunate enough to work with are have really amazing examples of getting students out into the real world and making genuine contribution during your time as students. So we are truly impressed, for example, with the work of the Schubert Center for Child Development, a multidisciplinary center here on camp campus that has absolutely um, developed its capacity to engage both students and faculty in the public policy process in a variety of ways, be it in placing students in externships with policy-related organizations that impact child-related issues, or the contributions of the faculty themselves in extraordinarily relevant ways in real-time um, public policy making. And so that center has a genuine commitment to do that in sophisticated, practical, real-time ways that respond to the real-time world of policy making, not on what one might think of as sort of a more traditional academic research time frame. So they respond and work in real-time um, in ways that have been enormously influential, um, particularly in reforms of Ohio's juvenile justice system. And um, they've, they've documented that beautifully, and it's a really wonderful example of the university's impact in the real world on children's issues that not only benefits children in Greater Cleveland, but statewide, and, have be, and there's been a national spotlight shown on the types of reforms that the center has been influential in, in driving. So those placements, and I know that I, I wouldn't begin to know all of the different ways that the university places students out into um, internships and externships, but I, I can't overstate how valuable we've seen that be 
especially when done in partnership with the expertise of the faculty here and bringing the faculty out as, and this is why I said scholar activists, as, as genuine scholar activists in real time in the policy world, you are sitting on an enormous stockpile of intellectual resource here. And whether it's through the Center on Urban Poverty and uh, Community Development or the Schubert Center for Child Development or many of the other places, there's, been, there's the opportunity for, for real world impact and that should be embraced, supported at the central levels of the university. <laughs> and I don't think we need to worry about students that would be in this building or people right. across the street studying social work. They're in these programs because they have a desire to do good and they're already on their own stepping forward. I think the ones that we need to inspire are those folks that are in the general public. Uh, Cleveland, while we're not the city we once were population-wise and we have the challenges and people are moving out, uh, the rich tradition of civic engagement that we have with the city club and money's establishing uh, the cultural institutions we have just in this neighborhood, uh, we're about to have a huge transfer of wealth. And the Gunn Foundation money that started in 1952 and the families moved away, but they still are investing in Cleveland is an inspiration to me. The fact that the money was made here and the family who's no longer here is still committed. Uh, as we go through this process of folks retiring, the baby boomers, Again, the transfer of wealth. Uh, that next generation of civic-minded individuals is who we really need to get to. And I don't have an answer of how do, we, how do we capture these people and tell these stories unless they already have a family tradition that they're gonna live on just naturally because it's part of the family's core. Uh, so I think that's the real challenge. One idea I've seen work really well that I think could be done more is putting the, to the power of philanthropy directly into hands of students, whether it be through um, crowdsourcing mechanisms that are obviously exploding. Um, but we've seen truly powerful outcomes when students are given even what we might think of as a genuinely modest amount of resources, so several thousand dollars perhaps. And I know that that's not easy to come by, but if there's any way to create even the smallest pool of funds for students in the course of study to be able to direct um, into the community, it provides an incredible um, avenue into the power of philanthropy. So when you have to go through um, an, an analytic process, a divining process, a decision-making process about where to invest inevitably scarce resources, whether it's a thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, it's never enough. We've always got to make decisions, but putting that decision actually into the hands of students at any level that you can we've seen have an incredibly powerful effect, not only in the moment as to what a decision might be to invest in, but also just in stimulating the desire to continue to engage in making donation, making contribution, making decision about investment that can really live far beyond the term of any one class. Um, so I would encourage more student philanthropy op opportunities. On, the, on that very high note, we're going to have to wrap our session so we, we can make it next door. Would you join me in thanking? Thank you for having us. Thank you all for coming. Please come back on March 24th for our next installment. And just so you know, we will not be in this room. We will be down the hall in 115. Uh, please join us. We'll have two uh, graduates of the Mandel School who spent time as practitioners and then moved into grant making roles. And we're really interested to hear what they see as uh, for practitioners bringing their knowledge base to the world of philanthropy. So thank you again.